Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. And in this week's local news, a big payday due to a local lawsuit. And who is the township going to sue and learn why? Stay tuned and learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. Before you think about taking your eyes off the road while driving, think of this. Oxford Village Police were called to a rollover accident last week. The driver, who suffered injuries and was transported to a local hospital, had taken their eyes off the road for a matter of seconds and lost control of their vehicle. No other individuals or vehicles were involved, so be careful out there. After having been fired from her job on suspicion of embezzlement, Former Oxford Village Deputy Clerk Pat Pad recently received a $300,000 settlement from her former employer. After more than three years of court proceedings and a jury not finding Pad guilty of the village charges, she was exonerated. Shortly after, Pad countersued for malicious prosecution, asking for more than $2.5 million in restitution, but awarded the $300,000. Now, here's a reminder to always be aware of your surroundings, even in our own hometown. Last week, a woman shopping in a South Lapeer Road business noticed a man wearing a light-colored jacket, blue jeans, and a cap. They started to follow her as she was walking to her car. After quickly getting into her car and locking the door, she noticed the suspect then began following another woman who was going into the store. The suspect ran when the first lady shouted to the second woman to run into the store. Then she called police. When officers arrived, they scouted the area but were unable to locate the suspect. So please, especially during the busy season, always be aware of your surroundings and call the police if you notice anything a least bit suspicious. Do you know who your child is texting? One Oxford mom found out and possibly saved her daughter's life. Suspicious of her 12-year-old's texting indulgent, an Oxford mom discovered her daughter had been communicating with a guy she met on the internet who texted that he would be arriving from Canada very soon. Mom quickly intervened and was threatened by the stranger's text when he responded he knew where they lived and they needed to watch out. A police report has been filed so kids, please be cautious. This is Oxford, and we still had a guy threatening to come here. Be responsible when on the Internet because there's serious dangers out there. Oxford police arrested a man they found at a Pontiac Street address on an outstanding arrest warrant issued by the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. In lieu of bond, he was arrested and transported to the Oakland County Jail. It appears the Chinese education group Wei Ming no, is no longer interested in building their dormitory and classroom complex on the Oxford High School property. The formerly proposed lease agreement fell through. The sticking point is a need for an exit strategy on the part of Wei Ming and Oxford's desire not to provide one. If the partnership were to fall through before a 20-year lease was up, Oxford did not want the building sold to some outside interest groups. Oxford insisted if the building were to be located on the high school property, it should go to Oxford. If not turned over to Oxford at Wei Ming's expense, the land would be restored to its original state, minus the building. The Wei Ming says they are now looking for an Oxford off-site private property to build on. A debate between outgoing Oxford School Board members and newly elected unseated members regarding the hiring of a new superintendent to replace Dr. William Skilling in August of 2015 resulted in the board declaring a decision to fill the job can wait until all new board members are seated. Since Dr. Skilling will not leave his post until August of 2015, some members feel there is plenty of time to select a leader for that job. Fire Chief Pete Schultz has finally hit the boiling point, and if you know Pete Schultz, it takes a long time. The chief is fed up with their Ford equipment and wants restitution from the auto giant. Out of four ambulances used by the Oxford Fire Department, two have been out of service for more than 200 hours. 
both with the same type of engine problem. The chief says they're out for repairs so many times that his department has to rely on Addison and other communities for assistance, truly an unsafe event for those needing ambulance services. The dealership has replaced countless parts, still both vehicles continue to fail, and after countless talks with Ford, that's produced no agreeable resolve. The Oxford Township Board of Trustees of now finally agreed to sue Ford Motor Company for some type of closure to make our residents a little safer in an emergency. You know, Terry, I can well understand, you know, mm -hmm. Chief Schultz's concerns yeah. and, and issues involving this yeah. Ford. I had a similar situation, as you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, mine turned out a little different than what theirs is. I didn't have to sue anybody. But uh, my Ford gave me all kinds of problems. I put about yeah. $2,500 into it, you oh, know, at the yeah. dealership. Yeah. And the dealer just could not resolve the issue. He did talk to the manufacturer several times and try to get them to resolve the issue. They refused to do so. And finally, they just threw their hands up and they said, we can't go any further with this. We'll purchase your vehicle from you. Shame on Ford. Yep. It shouldn't be the onus of the dealership uh -huh. to keep your business. It should be theirs. And what is our dealership going to do with two ambulances? I hear here for the township board that they're going to stand behind the chief and mm -hmm. fight this one out because uh, they really can't, Ford can't ignore an entire community's safety. Yeah. So uh, good for them. I, I'm not behind suing anybody. I, I was not happy about reporting on that um, previous story about the mm -hmm. village having to pay out 300000 Litigation has cost these communities way too much, mm -hmm. but good for them. Yeah, I really I hope, appreciate it. I hope Ford, you know, does you know settle this issue and take mm -hmm. care of it, you know, yeah. in a, in a good way. Do the right way. thing, for heaven's mm -hmm. sakes. Yep. Yeah. Now, I want to mention too that I was stopped in at the uh, Village Police Department, uh -huh. and um, uh, Debbie came up to me and she said, "We get a lot, a lot of lost and found items, you know, that come in here. Sure. And we have two, for example, that uh, you probably should mention on the air. And one is a uh, All American doll that yeah. some little girl left in the That's community center, and they're yeah. very expensive. They are well over two hundred dollars, I understand. Oh, I know that. And mm -hmm. uh, the other thing was a Cub Scout or a Boy Scout sash, you know, with all the uh, awards that they had sure. earned. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so that's a lot I'm, of work. Yeah, I'm sure some, mm -hmm. some young man or uh, young lady that yeah. earned those would like to have that back mm -hmm. as well. Just keep yeah. in mind that if you've lost anything out there, do check with the village uh, police. Sure. And also, we have a right. sheriff's department down the street. I'm sure they have similar items. We'll keep an eye at both places, too, and maybe continue to report on what's being found in the community and the good-hearted people that are turning them back into the lost mm -hmm. and found. And uh, also good for the school board. They made the right decision. I'm really glad to hear that. Oh, what did this they do? Week, the school what, what board um, decided not to follow through and and the story. Oh yes, okay, on, that's yeah, right. Not to follow through and hire somebody prior to them leaving. As an, a former board member, mm -hmm. um, it's nice to be a part of that decision if you're going to have to deal with that person from your. Mm -hmm. Four years forward. So. Yeah, right. And actually, yeah, that decision is made by other communities, you know, in like situations. Mm -hmm. They've decided to do the same thing, yeah. wait until the, the new board members come in to make those major decisions that affect the community. Good idea. Onward and upward and on to the new year. And speaking of that, you definitely have a safe holiday, everybody out there. This is our last um, newscast of this mm -hmm. season. And Merry Christmas. So, thank you. Same <laughs> to you. And I will Hi. say that. That's Oxford News. This week, if you'd like to learn more about it, these stories and others, stop by your local store and pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper. Or better yet, catch us right here at Oxford Community News. And coming up next on OCTV, tune in for Oxford Local Sports, then catch Oxford School News with John Ochins. After that, join us with Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. That's it for Oxford News this week. I'm Terry Stiles, and this is where your news is closer to home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching.
Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. In our first story, it was time to wake up. On December 6, NASA's New Horizon probe woke up from its hibernation and began the next stage of its journey to Pluto. On July 14th, New Horizons will reach its closest approach to the dwarf planet, about 6,200 miles above its surface, and that's closer than some satellites orbit Earth. And still in space, Gale Crater on Mars was once a large lake that could have stuck around long enough for life to get started. New observations from the Curiosity rover, which has been driving around the now dry crater floor since August of 2012, show evidence of multiple cycles of water flowing into a large shallow lake that could have lasted tens of millions of years. Since shortly after it landed, Curiosity has been driving around Mount Sharp, the three mile high mountain at the crater's center. It reached the mountain's foothills in September, and the team is busy drilling and analyzing rocks there in pursuit of the rover's primary mission, finding signs that Mars was once hospitable to life. The view from the road looked optimistic. On the way to Mount Sharp, Curiosity found evidence of flowing rivers and fresh water where simple microbes could have made themselves at home. But two major questions remained. Was that water there long enough to support the emergence of life? And how did Mount Sharp form in the first place? In a news conference December 8th, the rover team presented a possible answer to both questions. Gale Crater was filled up with a lake that dried out and reappeared several times in the distant past, laying down sediments that make up Mount Sharp in bursts of hundreds of thousands to millions of years. In its drive towards the mountain, Curiosity first encountered conglomerate rocks full of pebbles that were deposited by rivers. But as it continued south and uphill, the landscape changed to sandstones that were tilted in the same direction toward the mountain. This presented a certain paradox, said project scientist John Grutzinger of the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. If Mount Sharp had been there and water had been flowing off Mount Sharp, it would have been flowing downhill to the north. But the rocks that are exposed show the water flowing to the south. The resolution of the paradox is that Mount Sharp was not there when the water started flowing. Instead, water flowed from the cratered rim towards the interior, filling up an ancient lake. At the base of Mount Sharp, sandstone layers became much thinner and flatter as if they were laid down more slowly and without strong currents str uh, swirling around them. We think that's what we're seeing here, lake, flo lake floor deposits, Grutzinger said. Cycles of wet and dry periods could have filled up the crater with sediment that was later eroded, leaving the mountain that remains today. And back on Earth, the seemingly inevitable collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet and the associated sea level rise are happening faster than previously thought. Earlier this year, two papers revealed that several glaciers on the West Antarctic ice sheet seem to be on an unstoppable retreat into the sea and will collapse completely in the next 200 to 1,000 years, raising sea levels by about 24 inches. Because the glaciers helped to stabilize the ice sheet, that could mean the whole sheet is doomed, causing around 13 feet of sea level rise. Now, Sunke Schmidtko from the Humholtz Center for Ocean Research in Kiel, Germany, and his colleagues have revealed some of the processes that are driving the melting. And it turns out they weren't being produced by climate models that predict future melting, meaning the process is happening faster than thought. Schmidtko's team combined a range of data sets measuring seawater properties such as salinity, which drops when ice melts nearby, and temperature at different depths and locations going back to 1975. They found that Western Antarctica has, in recent years, seen warmer, saltier water being driven under the shelf, the part of the ice sheet that sticks out over the ocean. The warmer water comes from the deep and is pushed up under the ice shelf by changing wind patterns, some of which are in turn driven by global warming. Until now, it wasn't clear exactly what processes were driving the melting, says Sarah Gile from Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego. It could have been caused by water moving faster and thus carrying heat faster, for example. The results are transformative, Giles says. They tell us to focus on temperature or water mass changes rather than velocity. And she adds they are a step towards developing a better understanding of the physics of ice shelves and towards making better climate change projections. Exactly how the new results will change models isn't clear, but Schmidtko says it's likely to be bad news because the existing models do not take this warmer water into account. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. We'll be right back.
Hi there. My name is Kathy Ritter and I represent the American Red Cross in the Oxford and Lake Orion area. I hope you are all well and preparing for a wonderful holiday season. I wanted to share some information with you regarding the donation of blood during this busy time. Thanksgiving and Christmas are normally very hard on our blood supply. The main reason is that so many of us are busy with festivities that we just don't make the time to donate blood. Well, I'm here to ask you to please, please don't forget about donating blood during the holidays. It would be great to say that illness will wait until the holidays are over, but that's just not the case. There are still many, many people who are waiting to receive life-saving blood. So why not give the gift of life this holiday? It's the best gift you can give and the best gift to receive. Take a look at all the blood drives in the month of December. Everyone who comes to donate will receive a $10 Honey Baked Ham coupon as a thank you for all that you do. Choose a drive that works best for you and make an appointment. You'll be so glad you did. Wishing you and your family a joyous, peaceful, and healthy holiday. See you soon. Welcome back to Oxford News this week, Oxford Sports. The Wildcat Varsity Boys basketball team actually kicked off their season with a slam dunk last week. After winning two games in a row, the first was 61-45. to The win took, uh, took place over Lake Orion on December 11th. Coach Henning definitely hopes this was a precedence on the season ahead, especially because Orion plays in a higher division. However, it also gave Oxford some uh, growing and confidence, but it also at the same time showed they needed a lot of work to do. The Wildcats then would roar on to beat Henry Ford Academy on December 13th at the Oakland County Showcase. The tournament, 78-20 win. Henning said he, he was uh, upset over that. However, they were supposed to play Southfield Lathrop. They had backed out at the last minute because many of the Southfield players were taking their ACTs. Leading the way will be four returning senior starters led by Jessica Murphy, who was actually signed with Wayne State University. Uh, Sherilyn Bannis, who has dined with Lawrence Tech. Junior starters are Christina Medici, Sky Donaldson, and additional returnees are Senior Janie and ABB. Uh, Abby B, I should say. We're, we're going to try to see how this uh, pronounce their uh, last name next time at the next broadcast. Grace Wasaki and Logan Metal. Coach Ebert also welcomed five new members to the varsity squad this year. The strength of the team will be on both sides of the ball, defensively and offensively, according to Emmert. However, their weakness is in need uh, to develop a depth chart. Uh, look, uh, the, you can look for all the games here at OCTV on Saturday and Sunday afternoons, or they're always at your fingertips when you log on OCCTV.org. Make sure to hit that Programs tab. The Oxford Varsity Boys bowling team kicked off their season last week with winning over Berkeley, the Berkeley Bears, in both Baker games with a win of 204 to 220 versus Berkeley's 141 and 133, followed by a fourth place win out of 24 teams. Uh, the girls at the Cougar Classic uh, the, uh, took place at Collier Lanes. Again, the varsity girls team kicked their season off by placing sixth out of 24 teams at the Cougar Classic. They had some real talent, according to Coach Claude Laffner, the coach of the Oxford bowling team. Wrestling has been quite a mainstay around Oxford. This year, there aren't many superstars on the team, according to coach Paul McDevitt. He explained, however, they are talented, they are working hard. Many of them will make a name for themselves as the season goes on. They do have a tough schedule ahead for this year's challenge. Uh, they'll be taking on teams uh, with uh, great uh, expectations. They take on Clarkston, Stony Creek, Rochester. They're always good teams to face in the OAA Red, which Oxford is in in the wrestling division. Oxford has won the OAA Red every year, according to McDevitt. Uh, our goal is to continue with the trend to win another OAA championship this season. The first overall goal of the season is to actually, though, have fun and be the best they can be. Also new to the coaching staff this year, former two-time MHSAA state champion who hails from Lapeer West. We're talking about the new coach, James Kish. It was Danny Caton and Ryan Gennord's show this past Saturday night at Troy Sports Center. If you don't know their names, well, that's because they play for the Notre Dame prep team. The duo counted for four goals of the Irish's four to win over the Avondale Oxford United hockey team. Uh, Caton scored for the first two in which uh, in the first two periods, and Gennord capped off the night with the game's last two. Each finished with three points. Daniel Mervar stopped 17 of 18 shots he faced on goal for the Notre Dame prep. 
Jack Demeveski, uh, the two assists. Brenton Brock scored the only lone goal for the Avondale-Oxford hookup. Oxford's hockey team not as doing as well as they should. They now face, they're now 0-7-1 on the season. They can only hope to go up. It's a little bit of a darker place around Oxford as we all kind of hang our heads uh, low going into the holiday season. Han Andrew Andy Vascasino. His smile, though, did brighten it up. It was also much, a much better place when Andy was around. He touched many lives. He was selfless uh, contributions to many people that he met uh, in the community. Uh, he's uh, been part of the uh, Youth Athletic League for four decades here in Oxford. A marvelous man would be what Helen Smith would say, longtime athletic booster, former school board member in 1952's Oxford graduating class. He was the kindest man I ever knew. He was always there to help the kids. He was there to help anybody. Vas Casino, a fixture in Oxford sports from 1966 to 2009, passed away on Monday, December 8, 2014, just two days after his 93rd birthday. Vas Casino's association with the Wildcat Sports began in the fall of 1966 as a volunteer member of the chain crew at home football games. Over the next 43 years, he did everything, literally everything. Vas Casino was the football team's equipment manager, responsible for repairing equipment and transporting it in and on to the games. He was also helped uh, to take equipment down for volleyball matches, basketball games, wrestling meets, at track meets as well. He served as a judge for the pole vault. Many Wildcat fans will remember Bass Casino as a smiling, friendly gentleman who was at the gate of the door taking tickets or stamping your hand at athletic events. He just wanted to be part of something that was good and solid. He made, it made him feel good and solid because he was all part of it. Coach Bud Rowley said Bass Casino was uh, Rowley's right-hand man. Rowley said it, uh, he hit it off with Bass Casino immediately back in July of 1973 when Bass Casino was the second person Bud Rowley actually met after he was hired by the Oxford District to be a teacher and junior varsity football coach. In September, September 2010, a story ran about Bud Rowley. Vas Casino praised Bud also in 2008. The Wildcat Athletic Booster presented Vas Casino with a varsity jacket. But the ultimate honor came back in 2010 when he became a charter member of the Oxford High School Athletic Hall of Fame. Beyond this involvement with the athletic department, Bass Casino was a sort of a guy that would, uh, be na you'd naturally gravitate towards. He was also referring Vass Casino's service during the World War II. He was part of the U.S. Army Signal Corps and was one of the brave troops who stormed the beach at Normandy June 6, 1945, a date that everyone would know as D-Day. Vass Casino, who was a native of Detroit, 1938 graduate of Denby High School, worked at Fisher Body in Pontiac. He married Judy Valentine in Oxford. On July of 1964 at Emanuel Congressional Church and soon began working as a custodian at the Oxford schools. He spent more than 20 years with the district, retired as a head custodian in the 1980s. He lived in Lakeville for 32 years. Once again, our thoughts with the, that family and our heads are a, 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 bit, uh, a bit down. And Andy was always there at all the games. You always saw him on the sidelines. I, tell you, I think we're going to probably do, be doing a story in the future uh, more about his life maybe on my life. Check it out. Anyways, that's going to wrap it for sports. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. Always look at OCCTV.org for programs that we have for sports or any of our shows. OCTV Saturdays and Sundays are reserved for sports 1 to 6. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. On behalf of Oxford News This Week and Oxford Sports, I'm Jamie Hughes. Take care. I would love to have all the local World War II veterans on my life. Just think about it. These folks were born around World War I, grew up during the Depression and Prohibition, and then went to fight for us in Europe and Japan. What great stories they could share. What examples they are. What inspirations. Some of them and others are coming up on my life Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., Saturdays at 10 a.m. If you have any suggestions, please call us at the station. We'd love to hear from you. This is John Ochins. Join us on Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, Cadillac plans to introduce a rearview mirror embedded with high resolution streaming video that gives the driver more expansive rear vision unobstructed by headrests, passengers, and the car's roof or rear pillars. Cadillac estimates that the mirror provides a field of vision four times greater than a traditional rearview mirror. The technology will be introduced on the 2016 CTX large sedan late next year. 
The closest comparison to this kind of rear vision would be driving a convertible with a top down, says Travis Sester, uh, executive chief engineer for the CT6. Gentex Corporation will supply the mirror and Sharp produces the HD camera, a Cadillac spokesman said. The video processing technology was jointly developed by Sharp and GM. The camera will be mounted on the car's rear end and streamed to the mirror, providing a wide view of the lanes behind the car, including traditional blind spots. The mirror will be embedded with a high-definition liquid crystal display. A water-shedding coating applied to the lens maintains visibility regardless of conditions. The camera reduces glare and adjusts for low-light conditions better than traditional auto-dimming mirrors, says GM. The video stream can be turned off with a switch on the underside of the mirror. The CT6, a rear-wheel drive sedan that Cadillac is positioning against the Mercedes S-Class and BMW 7 Series, is expected to be unveiled this spring at the New York Auto Show. And Chrysler is Chrysler no more. Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, the Netherlands-based parent company of what was Chrysler Group LLC, says that it has changed the name of its U.S. affiliate from Chrysler Group to FCA US LLC. The change is effective immediately. The parent company also said Italy's Fiat Group Automobile SPCA, SPA has changed its name to FCA Italy SPA. The letter-only name removes the name of Walter P. Chrysler from the company he founded in 1925 for the first time in its history. In a statement, the automaker said the name change doesn't affect the company's headquarters location in Auburn Hills, Michigan, its holdings, management team, board, or brands. The statement also noted that FCA US LLC remains proud of its joint heritage and that the company continues to build upon the solid foundations first established by Walter P. Chrysler in 1925, as well as a rich fiat heritage that dates from 1899. The corporate name change doesn't affect the names on the company's US automotive brands, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Fiat, and Alfa Romeo, or their marketing efforts. And then who's the best contest? The Auto Enthusiast sister publication of Automotive News, December 16th, named the Volkswagen Golf GTI and GMC Canyon truck as its best of the car and best truck for the year. The GTI beat a group of finalists that includes the Alfa Romeo 4C, Ford Mustang, and Mercedes-Benz C-Class. And the GMC Canyon bested the likes of the Chevrolet Colorado, Lincoln MKC, and Porsche Macan. Four cars and four trucks make the grade, and Auto Week editors put them through rigorous road handling tests at the Michigan International Speedway in Brooklyn, Michigan. This is where a vehicle transcends the numbers and shows if design, performance, and pure driving passion meld into an Auto Week best of the best pick. The GTI is in its seventh generation, but the 2015 model has set a new standard for value, practicality, and performance. It's an incredibly fun car to drive, and Auto Week said it couldn't keep its editors out of it. VW's improved two-liter two, uh, uh, turbo four-cylinder engine powers the GTI. Featuring a choice of two great gearboxes, the GTI is an approachable, practical performance car. It satisfies every level, and the new chassis makes it a blast to drive on the track or on the street. The handling is simply superb, with the rear end happily stepping into safe, controllable oversteer. It's a car any driver can have fun with. The GTI was also a stand-up because its price, quality, uh, and utility make it a flexible ride and a great value. The GMC Canyon offers something many thought they'd never see again, a smaller pickup big on utility, usability, and refinement. It has just over a 1,600-pound payload and a 7,000-pound of towing ability, making it practical for most work sites, though it's quiet and comfortable enough to please commuters. The truck's rugged looks and available off-road equipment make it a perfect for those hobbies taking them into the wild, but who might not want to drive a full-size pickup truck during the work week. Well, that's it for this edition of Auto Talk. Get out there and buy those vehicles. <laughs> I'm Dave Kenny. As always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. Whether it's an upcoming musical in the Fine Arts Center, a world's robotics competition, a new program for preschoolers, or a new superintendent, if it concerns our schools, we'll have it on Schooling Around. This is John Oceans. Join us Mondays through Fridays 
at 4.30 and 10 p.m. Part of Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. Thank <laughs> you.